We might be too young to have a spotted cow, but we are both diehard Packers fans. I could talk about this for hours. He was my legend. He was my quarterback one. Taysom Hill, forever in my heart. We have a kind of a reputation of being the young, the young diehard fans. How is that, Dr. Pepper Taysom? Amazing. Okay, good. Let's keep it under 25 minutes, all right? We are back here at the Underage Packers podcast, episode 83, into our second season, week six, Big B. I cannot believe how fast this season is flying. Uh, th- thanks for joining me. Thanks for showing up. Yeah, um, happy to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me on this wonderful yep. show. Uh, you, my pleasure. Um, <laughs> anyways, we're going to be talking, obviously, about the Bears game. We'll be recapping a little bit about the Cincinnati game. And then later, we will be joined by – it's Bears. So, we will be joined by the one and only Matthew Ramage, notorious Bears hater. I'm so excited for this episode. The Piggly Wiggly on your shelf with the cheese head is ready for this episode. Let's go Damn ahead. Right. What was that? Damn right he is. And, you know, Always what about – what what about uh, Lil Tun? Is he ready? Yes, he is. Just he's he's vibing. Lil Tun just he's with uh, you know he's got Piggly Wiggly next to him. He's got Aaron Rodgers, Clay Matthews with yep. the the highlighter yellow hair. I love it. So <laughs> let's get to talking about some football. So Big B, you know you remember about the disaster that happened last week when we tried to preview the Packers game against Cincinnati. Yes. yes a- AF- a- AFC North team that uh, AFC team in general that we do not pay attention to at all. <laughs> we pay more attention to the Bears, but even though, even th- knowing that, I wanted to do some research this week. So I Good think I, I did some extensive research. I listened to Matt Nagy's press conference, um, which might I add, he seems like a nice guy. Um, <laughs> you know, I hope, I hope he gets his feelings hurt this weekend, but he seems like a nice guy. Um, and then we'll be talking. So I did some research here. I think I did some, uh, got some good stats for us to talk about. Not Peter Bukowski level. Um, if we're ever talking about DVOA as a serious talking point, please. I, I don't know what to tell you. And then we've gone off the deep and we've gone off the rails that we should have <laughs> been on off the direction that we should be here on, on underage factors. So some minimal stats to look like, look at that I think will spark some good discussion to, between us. Uh, so first let's talk about one of the most frustrating things in the Packers fourth win of the season against the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, so me and Dara talked about this game. Dara Kerger uh, talked about this game on Monday um, if you haven't checked that out, I highly recommend it. I think, uh, Dra, he's very smart. Uh, he knows what he's talking about. Um, and we had a, a great chat, so that was fun. So make sure you check that out. And one thing that both of us agreed upon was the lack of efficiency by the Packers so far this year in the offense compared to last year, where that was their bread and butter. That's how they were able to win 13 football games and get their first seed in the NFC. Um, with you know so they had 80 percent red zone efficiency last year this year through five games it has gone down to 55 percent 27th in the league 27th on a team with Aaron Rodgers Devontae Adams Aaron Jones Robert Tunyon the same exact skill players on this team as last year that had that were number one in the league at red zone efficiency and now they're 27th and you might say, well, you know, what happens like all stats that were that are looked at so far this year with the Packers uh, it's thrown out there? Well, what if you remove that first week against the Saints? Well, even in the last three games, so just the Bengals, the Lions and the 49 or the Bengals, the 49ers and the Steelers, uh, they are 25th in the league. So this red zone offense, Oof. Uh, like I mentioned, they have. Most of the same key players around. The the one thing you could point to, though, is the offensive line, which although they are performing amazing, 
uh, for considering the circumstances of not having that David Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins these past three weeks. Uh, that could throw timing off on Aaron Rodgers, more pressure on him. That's one thing you could point to. But even outside of that, I think the play calling in the red zone by Matt LeFleur and Nathaniel Hackett, the gold zone, has really been lacking the creativity. Um, you know, Darrell mentioned the Devontae Adams, the motion that Devontae Adams, other wide receivers were so good at, at Matt LeFleur's offense in general, but especially in the red zone that created separation like last year against the Rams, uh, where Devontae goes to the other side. There's a miscommunication that's designed to happen between Jalen Ramsey and his cornerback on the other side, especially if they're playing man coverage, uh, it really messed them up. And that's just one example of how Matt LeFleur and Nathaniel Hackett were able to devise some really creative plays in the red zone uh, last year. And that has really been lacking so far. Uh, Big B, is that noticeable on uh, TV when you're watching the game? Yeah, and I was I was going to say exactly what you just said, pretty much word for word. Huh. Yeah, it's it's really weird seeing seeing like last year's offense and this year's offense in the red zone. I feel like this year's offense has really just like ran it up the middle twice, like inside the five. They just run up the middle twice and then just pass no motion in that pass pass play at all. It just seems like really vanilla once we get like inside the five, uh, inside like inside the 10 or from the 10 to the five. I mean, yeah. I don't really know, but I feel like it's like the same exact thing. But I feel like they just really have gone vanilla in mm -hmm. the gold zone this year. And it's really, really weird coming off of last year, how successful they were. For sure. And they've the reason they're still able to put points on offense, they're not the 40 burgers. I mean, last year coming out the gate at this point, uh, I think they had they had a 40 burger in Minnesota next week against the Lions doing the same thing. Week three against the Saints, uh, 37. So uh, they've been scoring points out as many as last year. But yeah. like the both of us mentioned, to see uh, uh, the the sharp uh, decrease is kind of kind of surprising, almost concerning. Um both Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams and Matt Lafleur were asked about uh, the red zone, the the decline in red zone efficiency. Aaron Rodgers and Adams both said they need to be more aggressive, whatever that means. Um, and Lafleur said a simple, uh, kind of a simple coach talk thing about that it's nothing to be concerned about, um, and that it's kind of a matchup thing that they've been trying to work out. Um, that they haven't been able to do as much creative stuff as they'd like. And, yeah. um, and some, how we tie this into the Packers opponent this week, the bears um, is the bears. Their def defense is really good. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here, but the bears are third in red zone defense. So that last year would be like, wow, this might be a good matchup to watch. Uh, but right yeah. now there's, it's how the Packers have performed so far in the red zone, like you mentioned, Big B, two runs up the middle, which uh, the Bengals specifically were really good at stopping. They That was never going to happen all game. Uh, and then they still tried it down in the red zone. So running up the middle is not going to happen this week. They're going to have to get, get more creative against a really tough Bears defense, especially in the red zone. Another thing that I have been noticing on the offensive side of the ball. And shoot, uh, there's really kind of two sides to this argument that both make sense. And it's kind of silly to complain about it at this point uh, with the results that we've gotten. But the offense's um, reluctancy to throw the ball and really, uh, I say the offense and not Aaron Rodgers, the, re the offense's reluctancy to throw the ball to anybody besides Fonte Adams, Aaron Jones, or A.J. Dillon. I, I love seeing A.J. Dillon, but if it's not going to Devontae Adams, it's going to Aaron Jones on a designed screenplay or just a check down. And the reason I say the offense and not Aaron Rodgers is because I, it's pretty much impossible to tell whether that's – obviously, Devontae Adams is a really skilled player. It's going to be easy for him to gain some separation – 
but and then may, there's obviously going to be some more design plays for Devonte, but then Aaron Rodgers side of things, there has definitely been some examples. Uh, you, the most strong one being the interception near the first quarter after the defense just got a three and out. Aaron Rodgers throws a horrific throw to Devontae Adams. I have, I mean, he's rolling out to the right. Sure, that's his advantageous side, but he's rolling <laughs> out to the right. And it, uh, I mean, I just, uh, for one, it's not a good throw. But even if it was a good throw, it makes no sense to make that pass. It wasn't even like a third and long situation. So, uh, sure, Devontae Adams is a great player. Getting him the ball as many times as possible is not a bad idea, especially when he is playing out of his mind, getting yards after the catch like he was against the Cincinnati Bengals. But when you have plays like that, um, and obviously eventually you'd think the opposing defenses are going to have to figure out some way to make Aaron Rodgers throw it to somebody else. Um, Robert Tunyon being one of them, having only eight yards in his past game against the Bengals. Um, and Matt Fleur was asked about that. I can't remember from who, but that doesn't matter. There's only a, a very select group of people who ask which press con- <laughs> which reporter asked a press conference question. Um, yeah. But he, he kind of said specifically with Tunyon um, that they've been using him in different ways, getting to different teams, a lot of times in blocking um, and kind of delayed passes. But Big B, is there any kind of hypothesis you have here on why the Packers never really uh, get the ball outside of Devontae Adams? Yeah, um, I was I was thinking about this um, a few nights ago, and I was really thinking, like, it has to be has to have something to do with MVS being mm-hmm. out. Like, I f- feel like he's he. Well, he, I'm not, I don't feel like he is the guy that they stretch the field with, and they have seems like they've been having trouble stretching the field since he's been out, and he's of course a big part of this offense, and that's definitely a big piece miss, missing. And then that, of course, once the defense realizes MVS is actually a problem and doesn't drop the ball like he used to, Devontae yeah. Adams will get open. And same with um, Dominique Daphne being hurt. They don't really go yeah. to the I form um, very much since he's been out the past three weeks. And that's also a reason why they have been behind the sticks on the early downs because of that. Uh, the run team or run, oh, geez. run, uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Jesus. Run blocking Fumbling. injuries. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And um, that could also affect Robert Tunyon's um, season so far sure. because they can't get the outs stretches going and then do yeah. a little bootleg thing in the Bob that I love that play very much. I'm sad that that's not working this year. Yeah. So that's, that's what I think. I don't know. Felt yeah, like I was just I, but who cares? I, no, I think he had some good points there. MVS and the injuries they have right now, all along the offense, um, they've been able to score points, but there is kind of some minuscule things that take away from Robert Tunyon, uh, from Robert Tunyon and other receivers' games. Um, MVS stretching the field, and that would open up a great opportunity for Robert Tunyon. Um, yeah. And then also, Robert Tunyon also being used more in that block, those uh, out of the backfield, specifically blocking. Um, because Dominique Daphne is hurt, Josiah DeGuara is healthy now, but he is used more now in those blocking situations. So um, we'll be sure. I, I still tend to think um, that later into the uh, season where the, off- the offense is able to get things going, get into a groove that two of these two things that we were just talking about will get better, the red zone efficiency and the spreading the ball around, which, the you know, like I said, they're having Devontae Adams get 200 yards a game opposed to um, Randall Cobb, Devontae Adams, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and Nelson Lazard getting 50 yards. It doesn't really matter, but there are some situations where, uh, forcing it to Devontae Adams can become a problem for Aaron Rodgers. And you can also look at um, 
the offense struggling because of they don't have that Tyler Irvin guy. They mm. put in Randall Cobb, um, Mark Rogers, EQ. You saw a little bit of that last week. Like they haven't had that threat on that Tyler Irvin type role this this year. Yeah, God. When you mentioned EQ, I just like scuffed. I I know I saw it. <laughs> EQ, man. I I talked about a few times. I, and I said on my Twitter when I saw that he was um, elevated to the 53-man roster because uh, with the COVID rules that I hope become permanent rules, uh, you can now uh, elevate a player from the practice squad for just one game, but you only get two of those per season. Um, so they use their two elevations or activations on EQ these past two weeks. Now they – they couldn't do that anymore with EQ to promote him from the practice squad for just one game. So they signed him to the 53 man roster and you'd think, Oh, well, when Marquez Velda Scanlon was out, then EQ must've made some great plays, uh, must've found some, shown some things you didn't show in the preseason, but dude, EQ did not show anything special, any reason to me, even yeah. in running blocking scenarios, anything to why he should be on the 53-man roster right now, why he should have a spot over guys like Jawan Winfrey or whoever else. It's it's really bizarre to me to uh, elevate EQ. Hell, I feel like he's played more snaps than Malik Taylor this For year. Sure. And, he, and he made the roster. Like, right. I don't, I don't understand. Like, I feel like Malik Taylor would be way better – than EQ right now. Like, I feel like you'd block yep. better, you'd get open at least, like, do things. And, like, ah, oh, drives yeah. me insane. I, okay. I don't know uh, what – it like, Malik Taylor had a great preseason. I don't know his blocking ability. But, man, yeah. he's, he's great on special teams. I don't know why he's not getting more receiving opportunities. Not a, that EQ is going out for routes every play, but – very confusing yeah. move to me to, to keep EQ on that 53-man roster. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, let's see here. Some last things I want to hit on. We're, we're, we're going pretty smooth on this episode. I really like it. I think we're uh, right. having some good discussions here. Uh, one, A few more things I want to hit on about this Bengals game, and then we'll transition to uh, Chicago Bears here, is Eric Stokes versus Jamar Chase, a cornerback wide receiver matchup, two rookies who played really well. And our friend um, Nico, elite takes on TikTok, dude, is absolutely insane on TikTok. Uh, we had him on before the draft because he had tons of draft content. He has, when we interviewed him, I think he, he just went semi-viral for his video, his film analysis on Miami Titan Brevin Jordan. He had like 10,000 followers. Now, dude makes like two or three film analysis type videos on TikTok every single day on football, basketball. And he has somewhere over 100,000 followers right now. <sighs> Pretty insane. Um, wow. So if you're not following him now and you're on TikTok looking for some NFL content, follow him. Yeah. Um, also because he had a great video on Jamar Chase and Eric Stokes matchup, um, which there was some times where Chase, he was obviously the higher regarded prospect. He's had more experience, gotten some more opportunities in the NFL so far, uh, but there were some times that Chase got the best of him, but there was also some times that Stokes uh, made some really good plays, getting physical, and unlike Josh Jackson, using his physicality to his advantage, and the, the play I point to is the one uh, at, in the first quarter uh, where at the start of the play, after his release, Jamar is able to get a really good release on him. And even though Stokes is really fast, we know with Kevin Keene, a fast 40-yard dash time doesn't always mean you're going to keep up with wide receivers. So Stokes is behind Jamar on a play. Uh, and then all of a sudden, thanks to a deep ball from Burrow, really, uh, Stokes is able to catch up with him and make a great pass deflection, preventing what would have gotten a play that would have gotten the Bengals at least to the five or four. So some great plays by Stokes, some great plays by Chase. Very entertaining matchup to watch with Jair Alexander out. Yeah. 
Um, next up, I want to talk about Mercedes Lewis. <laughs> Dog impression, bark impression, not as uh, not in my prime tonight. Um, oh boy, that, that was embarrassing. All right, moving on. <laughs> no, we still got to talk about Mercedes Lewis. We don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I can edit out uh, my my uh, bad barking voice, <laughs> but we still got to talk about the big dog himself, Mercedes Lewis. And the, because of just kind of a lot of things that I've been thinking about him this week, today during his press conference, the one play that he gets in overtime sets up, well, it sets up uh, a sack from Aaron Rodgers and then a 16-yard play to Cobb. But it's a 20-yard screen to Mercedes Lewis that gets the Packers into field goal range for the fourth time to make a game-winning kick. Um, and then the sideline just goes absolutely insane. We've heard so many times about this team, how much they love Mercedes Lewis. Uh, Matt Fleur loves Mercedes Lewis. Actually, uh, at the end of the game, when Mason finally makes it, um, when they're doing, like, the, everybody's hugging and cheering in Green Bay mess, uh, happiness all around. Uh, you see LaFleur just hugging Big Dog, and Matt LaFleur looks like a, just a, a very small human being <laughs> next to Mercedes. <laughs> but LaFleur loves Big Dog. Everybody at 1265 Lombardi and all of the fans love Mercedes Lewis, except a few casuals on Twitter who I had to argue with. I, oh, we've boy. talked about a few, a few times on this show. I, you and I are kind of past the point. We've outgrown the stage where we have to argue with every single bad take we see on Twitter. Yes. But yes. this off season, when the captains were announced, I saw some hater saying that Mercedes didn't deserve the captain badge. And I had to go through with them, get through it, get, get it through their mind that Mercedes Lewis is one of the most important players to the Packers' success, um, and that they should love them with their whole heart. Uh, yeah. Hey, sometimes you just have to go off on Twitter. Like, you went off on some casual, I went off on Jermichael Finley. Like, we just have to do that sometimes. <laughs> well, see, Jermichael Finley is kind of a casual fan uh, at some points, but TMZ just went, <laughs> like, and, and unlike other casual fans, he, he has a voice on TMZ. Yes. Uh. But anyways, Mercedes Lewis, I love him. His legacy after he retires from the Packers, um, after riding off into the sunset, is going to be pretty phenomenal. Uh, for pretty phenomenal end of his career to remember after playing 14, 15 years in the absolute dumpster fire that is the Jacksonville Jaguars, and then coming to Green Bay. What was it in the off season of eighteen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it was after Martellus Pinnett. So uh, he finds a, a great role in Matt Lafleur's offense. So if the Packers are able to win a Super Bowl this year, I wouldn't necessarily compare him to a Charles Woodson type signing, but he definitely has that Charles Woodson type voice and leadership. And I, I was so ecstatic to see the Packers re-sign Mercedes even at 37, 38 years old uh, this past offseason. So that is my weekly Mercedes Lewis appreciation speech. And I and I had my inside sources on that Mercedes Lewis. Oh, my Lewis God. Oh, my God. I just forgot about that. that part, mister. Oh, my God. That is a phenomenal story. Yep. Um, I think we talked about it sometime on here. We're not going to talk about it again, just so you don't get in trouble. <laughs> when, he, when, he retires, when he retires, when he retires, when Mercedes retires, we'll tell the story. Okay. In depth. All right. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a hilarious story. <laughs> now let's talk here about the Chicago Bears. Um, oh, first off, we got some fun stats. Um, and before we kind of get into those, I know we just said we're getting into the Chicago Bears, but before we get into the Chicago Bears, one last thing. After the Packers play the Chicago Bears, David Bakhtiari will be eligible to return from the PUP list. He'll be able to, to practice then, and then he still has a three-week window where he doesn't have to be um, active on the team. So um, 
I presume I'd be very shocked to see him go out there against Washington. And it's kind of been very, I, I don't know. It's been interesting to see no updates about his injury, about his recovery. Uh, I asked him about how rehab was going before I rudely interrupted him on the Cheesehead TV fast watch party. Uh, I didn't realize I interrupted David on that first answer to my question until I went back and rewatched it. So David just needs to come on our show so I can get that right with him. And then we'd have a great chat. Um, But anyways, David, no updates really on his uh, recovery so far. And I, I think I have kind of a hypothesis, kind of two guesses to that really one is mainly because they do not want Washington teams that we're going to be playing in the next few weeks to know if they're going to have to prepare for David Bakhtiari or not. Um, yeah. And they, I, I hope it's not a bad indication, but the team is always going to be overtly cautious with injuries, especially with a big time player like David Bakhtiari, who is the highest paid offensive tackle uh, in the league before somebody stole that title from him this past off season. Okay. All right. Now we're going to talk about the Chicago bears. Okay. Are you sure this time? I am sure? completely sure. We're not, we, I have two fun stats about the bears to talk about. Uh, and then we'll be talking specifically about the mashup, the match matchup here. Okay. So right. Randall Cobb, this is a, one of the things right when we traded for Randall Cobb that I was looking so much forward to is when we played the Chicago Bears because the amount of iconic plays, catches that Randall Cobb has, I was going to say unlimited, but it's like three. Three is still a lot, though, for one player. Um, in fact, uh, th- nine, Randall has nine touchdowns against the Chicago Bears, which doesn't seem a lot like a lot, but for against one team uh, and in a, kind of a short span of time, that's pretty crazy. And he's only behind mm-hmm. Don Hudson and Billy Houghton uh, for the Packers in that wheelhouse. Uh, so, I mean, you have the one to win the division in 2013, the one that was, I think it was the final touchdown on the comeback in 2018, and then mm-hmm. an absolutely incredible catch. I can't remember what year it was, but Aaron Rodgers, so six touchdowns in one and a half. And I think that was, I think that was 2014, if I remember Okay, correctly. that makes sense. Um, yes. And Randall Cobb just makes an incredible acrobatic catch. Speaking about incredible Aaron Rodgers touchdowns against the Bears, uh, in the past 13 games against the Bears, 13, okay? So this is four games less than what a season will be starting this year. Rodgers has a 34 to two touchdown to interception ratio in the last 13 games, 34 to two interception ratio in a span of 13 games is absolutely incredible. Mind blowing. I say that's pretty good. Especially considering how good the Bears defense have consistently been. So Mm -hmm. that's why I have no doubt no fear really of the Bears defense, no matter how good it is, because it seems like every time, specifically with the Bears and the Vikings, every single year, they like to talk their junk. There's something new and exciting about them. Um, but like, and their defense is new and improved with both teams too, specifically about their defense. And then Aaron Rodgers just goes and throws all over the field. It's pretty wild. So that's Aaron Rodgers' stats for you. Let's talk quickly about the Bears' defensive side of the ball. They have some tough, tough players that they've kept around, and including one of my favorite players, Akeem Hicks. I feel like all Packers fans love this guy. Yeah. Dude is a tough player. He's a big, big man up there. Seems like he's been injured the last few matches, or at least not 100% healthy the last few times he's played the Packers, and that's the same case uh, this upcoming week. But Akeem Hicks, such a disruptor in the middle of the field at Noah's tackle, and um, he's going to certainly shut down some things up the middle with Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. 
Uh, then you also have, obviously, Khalil Mack. And somebody that plays kind of an underrated role for this spare defense, mainly because he's pretty new to the team. Uh, last year was his first year with him. The Robert Quinn, formerly of the Rams. And kind of, you know, Quinn kind of had it. Well, he was really good with the Rams. But uh, Leonard Floyd came from the Bears. He was first-round draft pick. Robert Quinn came from the Rams. And they kind of did a switcheroo. And it looks like those two kind of have better careers now with those two teams that they've recently signed with. So Robert Quinn, I think, plays a pretty underrated role in this Bears defense. So yeah. the, their front seven, Mack, Hicks, Quinn, um, I, some other guys that I'm forgetting right now, uh, their front seven is going to be a problem. And uh, once again, Packers offense line has a tough challenge on their hands. Looks like Josh Myers will be back this week, along with Elton Jenkins. They are hopeful about them, and those are a uh, key week to get those two guys back. Uh, now, also on that defense, moving past the defensive line, their secondary uh, was talked about so much um, uh, when the Packers were getting ready to play the Rams in the divisional round is the Vic Fangio-style defense and what they are, what the Rams were able to do with their safeties uh, and disguising what they're going to do. And it makes it really tough, even for quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers that are experts at reading the field and reacting to um, whatever the defense is showing. The Bears are also really good at doing that with their safety and secondary. So certainly something that Aaron Rodgers is going to have to keep his eyes peeled for. And Matt LeFleur is going to have to be ready for on offensive play calling. Okay. Big B, any thoughts you want to add uh, after my long ramble of notes on the Bears' defense? <laughs> um, not really. I think you, uh, hit, I think you hit everything uh, just just here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. For, is it Friday? Friday? Thursday? <laughs> it's Thursday. Thursday? We'll probably I wish it was Friday. Friday. Yeah. But the lovely people that are listening to this are listening on Friday, so – yeah. They're, they're, they're lucky. Good for them. Uh, so Bears defense is going to be tough. On the offensive side of things, obviously, they have their young quarterback. I'm If Justin Fields, look, Big B. Joey. Justin Fields. Yes. Can we, you know, can we just have a chat here? Though? If, yeah. If Justin Fields, if he ends up being – I think he's going to be really good. He has a lot of talent. Really mm-hmm. great player coming out of Ohio State. If he ends up being – a franchise quarterback that miraculously is able to take a trash franchise like the Bears to elite levels, deep playoff runs. I will forever curse the Denver Broncos and the Carolina Panthers for thinking Patrick Sertain and whoever other cornerback it was. I already forgot his name because it was so bad of a pick by the Carolina Panthers. Instead of taking Justin Fields because they had to trust Sam Darnold and Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater instead of, you know, they had to take their cornerbacks instead of Justin Fields. I will forever hate them because they took, uh, they gave the Bears a free chance to domination and great quarterback play, which they do not deserve. I do not know how they messed up that bad. I am. I hate that Trey Lance was such a perfect fit for Kyle Shanahan too. So I'm sure he's going to be a great ball player there. And if, you know, if Kyle Shanahan was an offensive genius that Trey Lance fits so perfectly in, maybe there's a chance that fields go at goes at three and then the Panthers and Broncos are smarter and they take Lance. It's just like uh, Dave Damashek's uh, YouTube series that I absolutely loved a few yes. years ago. Uh, the N if L. It had, a, it had an epic intro. I miss those videos. Those are great. I do. I love the – he had two Packers team points. It was um, Brett Favre, um, something somewhat post-Packers career, and then also yeah. with the Des Bryant catch. Those were some great animations, great videos. Yes. Um, but the NFL, another scenario here, what if the Chicago Bears did not get the opportunity – get Justin Fields he's going to be a great quarterback but in his uh, Matt Nagy Pack Bears coaching staff looks to be incompetent with their quarterback situation 
I, you know, maybe Saturday he'll say, uh, you know what, maybe we don't need Justin Fields starting. That's just been <laughs> how uh, flip flop the Bears have been with their quarterback situation so far this year. Mm-hmm. But he's going to be a great player. He's going to make some great plays as he has in his first few starts. But he's bound to make mistakes as a rookie. I think the Packers have to kind of dare Justin Fields to win this game. And for Green Bay, that's putting points on the board early. Also something they struggled with on offense so far this year. Putting points on the board early and stopping the Bears running game, which has a pretty thin um, running back room as of now. They have um, – Montgomery is hurt, right? Or Yes, he's in the IR. He, okay, so that's pretty big. Uh, Damian Williams also was added to the COVID list. Yes. So they have six rounder Khalil Herbert, who he had a, a fair game last week, 75 rushing yards against the Raiders defense, which is pretty atrocious along with many <laughs> other things going on in Las Vegas. Uh, but Packers is going to have to stop that six rounder. Khalil Herbert should be on paper. They should be able to do with that with Kenny Clark uh, and Devondre Campbell. But, that's going to be key, I think, challenge, daring Justin Fields to be, uh, win the game for the Bears with Allen Robinson, who is, was also not participating this week in practice. I'd expect he'd be ready to go, but Packers offense, Packers defense, my bad, make Justin Fields win this game for Chicago, make the most of the opportunities he gives you on his mistakes. And keep them inside the pocket, please. Don't let them get Boom. outside. Boom. That's uh, like, I hate that water. Like, it's so frustrating to me when this team, when defenses in general, let quarterbacks run all over them. I, I'm i going to have to, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do when we play Lamar Jackson or Kyler Murray. That's going to be a whole roller coaster of headaches for me. I'm, I might not have no hair because I pulled it all, all out by the time both of those games get done with. Right. Just first quarter. I mean, Jameis Winston should not have had as many great opportunities he did to run against us as he did. But, yeah, that's that's good, another good point that we're going to have to watch out for with yes. Justin Fields. With that being said, now it is time to trash talk the Chicago Bears, unless you have anything else you like, want to add about the, the Bears team, Bigby? No, let's just hop right into it. Let's trash talk the worst franchise in NFL history with Matt Ramage. All right, we are here with Matt Ramage. Matt, you, you don't have to, have to uh, cover up the spotted cow. All right, I wasn't sure because, like, this is an underage Packers podcast, <laughs> and uh, I'm doing some overage kind of stuff over here. So we are here with Matt to talk some trash about the Chicago Bears, his claim to fame, bread and butter at this point. Uh, but, but you were just saying, Matt, before we started recording that, you've been sick. So it's like you're, you're kind of on IR for your, your prime yeah. week here. Yeah, like, this is, like, the prime week. Like, this is how I very first started – like making Packers content was just trashing the bears. Yeah. And it's like bear week is like my time to shine. It's like, it's like my social media birthday kind of. <laughs> and I was sick. Like most of the week people were messaging me. Like, are you okay? What's happening? Why aren't you trashing the bears? But like, I, I'm, I'm a weak individual. Mm-hmm. So like, if I get like a little sick, I'm like, I am not doing anything. I'm going <laughs> to sat on the couch. Watch some ice cream. I, I, I watched some breaking bad. Like I just chilled out Wednesday, called and said to work, but I'm, I'm back now. I, I feel all right. Spotted cow. All right. I haven't even drank any spotted cow this whole week <laughs> since the Packer game. Wow. wow. That day. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was wild. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. After, after sun, Sunday night, I'm sure Wisconsin, I mean, Wisconsin alcohol consumption during Packers game already pretty high, but then after this game against the Bengals skyrocketed, I'm sure. Yeah, because that's how it is. Like, you either drink to celebrate a win. Yep. Or you drink to just sulk in your sorrows. Exactly. Especially if they'd have lost that game. I can't imagine being a Bengals oh. fan. Because, like, yeah. like, they're just, like, coming up, and they're, like, they got a good season. They got their quarterback. 
they're three and one. You know, the Packers are also three and one. Rodgers, like Crosby's missing field goals. You're right there. And yep. then to lose that way. Like I would have felt bad if it was, you know, being a Packer fan too, but being a Bengals fan, like that, that, that had to have been just ruthless. Yeah, that game in uh the 49ers as well, that that was so close to being like awful, depressing weeks for Packers fans. Both those yeah. two, if they lost, would have been heartbreaking. Yeah, it, especially the Niners game. I wanted to win so much. And I talked a lot of trash. Yeah, had a lot on the line there. I, I, do, I, I Sometimes I, I go into a game, like, I'm not going to talk trash because, you know, this is a good team. The Niners kind of have a number. Like, I'm confident, but maybe, you know, sometimes I'm not so confident, like, I'm going to run my mouth. But yeah. then, like, some fan will start talking trash. So then I'll just, like, I guarantee we're going to win. And now I'm just, like, all in. <laughs> Especially, like, Niner fans get me because, like, I know that's not why you have me on talk about the Niners, but the Niners fans get me because they call them from the Niner faithful. But, like, they're not there when they suck. And, like, you can't find them. And, like, that's what I was making videos about. Like, wh- where are you? I couldn't find you last year. <laughs> like, they lost the Super Bowl. There was no one there to, like, can, you know, welcome yeah. the team back. Like, I have no respect for Niner fans. I get a lot of trouble for that because I know Niner fans. People in my family, like, yeah, you shouldn't say that. Like, I, that's just what I think. I don't – I mean, if, if – I'm sure that there's real Niner fans. Those ones I got respect for, but I'm talking about the ones that are, that are just trash. And how do you have, like – the, the, the goal to, to call yourself Niner faithful when it's been proven time and time again that your fan base is not Niner faithful. Not loyal. Yeah. Like six of them. <laughs> six, six devout Niners fans in the world. <laughs> but uh, so we'll, we'll get some more closely to the Bears, but I want to talk, Matt. So, you know, you have your stuff with Quick Trip and everything, but. Or do you, do you fancy yourself uh, another Wisconsin chain? Do you fancy yourself some Culver's every once in a while? Yeah, I, I dig some Culver's. Well, they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. So, like, if, if it, 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 it's kind of like Quick Trip. Like, they're everywhere. So if you want to eat, like, you're driving by one anyways. Might as well stop at it. Yeah, exactly. I know, like, Culver's on, on Twitter is, like, the most, like, like, down the middle. Like, some people are like, it's everyone loves it, but I don't like it. And oh, I like it. Uh-huh. I mean, quick, quick Trip is my number one. Yeah. But like, it's different. Like, gas station is obviously different than Russian. But I, I love me some Culver's. Yeah. When I, when I went to uh, Wisconsin this summer, oh, boy. Uh, oh, boy. you know that it's always going to be a good story when it starts like that. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, there's, like, two or three Culver's in my range of driving. But when I got to Wisconsin, it was absolutely crazy. The amount of Culver's. It's only like Culver's is a McDonald's for Wisconsin for the uh, for the rest of the U.S. as is McDonald's. So that was crazy. They're, they're everywhere. You can find yeah. them across the street from each other. Probably. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but the reason I want to talk about is because today, October fifteenth, when this episode is released, they have a special Curder Burger, which has a fat cheese curd. On a, like a fat layer of cheese curd on top of a burger. I'm a big fan of their cheese curds. I love their butter burgers. And I, I'm, it's a one day only thing. So I'm, I'm definitely going to have to rush after school. Give me that curder burger. Probably have my stomach hurt for the rest of the night, maybe the whole week. That cannot <laughs> be good for you. Uh, so I'm, I'm certainly looking forward to that. Big B, are, are, are you going to, Try, try that that Curter burger. Ugh. Um, I don't know. I don't really feel like sitting on the toilet the entire weekend, so I think I might have to pass on this one. <laughs> you gotta I don't be. Think able- I've ever had one. What was that? I don't think I, I've ever had that. The I it's I think it's they originally had it as like a April Fool's joke this year, as like oh we're gonna do this, but it, it was just a, a joke or whatever, a, a spoof. And it, but now, like people were talking about on April Fools, like oh that that would be scrumptious. So now, <laughs> now, now the tomorrow is National Cheese Curd Day. So uh, they're they were doing that for one day. So I'm I'll definitely try that out. Yeah, okay. I, I might to give it a shot. I, I will for sure. Uh, now l- let's get to Chicago Bears. Now we were talking about in our episode earlier how they're it seems like every year with the Vikings too, but the bears, there's always something new that bears fans like to get all excited about. 
their defense has been consistently good for the past 40 years, ever since yeah, Mike Dicka in 1985. Um, so they always got that to brag about. But now, now it's Justin Fields. They're all excited about this young rookie quarterback, which is very talented. But, I mean, I, I do you think, Matt, they're a little too excited about Fields this rookie year? Yeah, I, I think they're too – I, I think the same thing. I actually, I actually like him. He seems like a good kid. Yeah. I think he could be a good quarterback, except for he got drafted by the bears. And I don't think that they know, they, they know how to handle quarterbacks. And it's not yeah. just this. I mean, I think this coaching staff is horrible. I don't think that I don't respect their coaches at all, but it's other, all their coaching staffs. Like if, if you're drafted by the bears and you're a linebacker, like a defensive end or your safety, you're probably going to have a good time. Like yep. you, you're gonna be successful. Their defense is always pretty legit. But like, if you're a wide receiver and draft by the Bears or the quarterback, like you're not gonna have a good time. You're gonna do your rookie contract. Unless you're a quarterback, they'll probably overpay you. You know, Jay Cutler that they, they, they didn't draft him, but they'll, they'll throw a bunch of money at you. Yep. You won't succeed because the offense scheme is gonna be trash. They're gonna de- depend on their defense to win. And just don't make mistakes, but you're gonna make a bunch. But uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, they're in a bad spot because I, I, I think Justin Fields is going to struggle this year. I think, you know, he's like every rookie quarterback. He's going to be off and on and have his games and have his off games. But if they don't like succeed and go do something this year, they're all going to get fired probably. Yeah. And that's like, so much pressure to put on because he knows like these athletes know, like if, if everyone knows like what it is with, with Matt Nagy, I'd, unless like they, they cut him a break. Cause if, 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 if they do okay, like, I know oh, that's a rookie quarterback. Yeah. We're going to keep him around or whatever. But, like, I think he changed some stuff, too, to make it – I think Justin Fields is, is, is doing a little bit better. But, uh, yeah, I, I, he's a rookie, so I, I think he's going to make mistakes, especially playing against great defenses. It's going to be hard for him. But I do think that they made a good draft pick, finally. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I hope they do. Uh, I hope, like you said, Fields can get them to just, like, seven and nine these next two, three years to keep Nagy, um, whoever their GM is that I, I, I forget. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I forget too. Like just keep them well enough. So like the bears keep on making excuses to keep that head coach and general manager. Yeah. Uh, Packers. We were talking about earlier, Matt of Randall Cobb's uh, plenty of insane plays against the Chicago bears over his career. So Expanding from Randall Cobb, do you have a favorite Packers Bears memory? It's gonna be that one uh, when uh, John Kuhn had that block. Mm. That's the one that always pops to mind. Like when, when, it was like I, I've, it was like third or fourth down or whatever, and Rogers just ran, or, uh, Cobb just ran straight up the field. There was like no time left, and uh, he just blew by the save because nobody thought he was gonna run straight up. The oh, field. and then Kuhn had had it wouldn't have happened with without that block. I forget what, what game that was. I think 2013 division winning game. Yeah, there it is. Ah, so he, yeah, but th- 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 there's so many like with Cobb, like, like yeah, like, probably my, my, my favorite thing about Randall Cobb is that that video of that kid yelling, Oh, Cobb, <laughs> not again. Oh. <laughs> and, <laughs> like, dude, I think, I think that's the best video probably on the internet. Football For sure. And like I posted a lot, and I, I, I like on Facebook, people are like, "Oh, you're making fun of a kid." Like I ain't making fun of him, dude. I actually like respect that kid because his passion. He has so much passion, and he's just so upset. Like I've been upset that upset. My kids have been that upset. We just didn't have cameras in front of our face, but like Dang. it's it's a beautiful video, and uh, and I, I I like seeing Bears fans sad about football. Yeah, that video is such a masterpiece, especially because uh right what he says um it's probably right when rogers i I remember the 2018 comeback game so well where rogers is you know after the second half break he's coming out there on the field warming up and i'm sure it's right then when that kid says um please do not tell me rogers is going to lead some insane comeback and then the following clips are rogers leading an insane 18 20 point comeback um that game is definitely up there with one of my favorite memories um you, your guy tommy crabtree obviously had that um 
oh, yeah. uh, great uh, fake field goal against them. Uh, and that would be mine, uh, but I, I don't remember it too terribly well. Um, I think if I had to, my favorite play that I can vividly remember is B.J. Rodgers' pick six against Jake yeah. Cutler in the NFC Championship game. Uh, I loved B.J. Raji as a, even as a kid. Uh, so that, that was great to see him score in the playoffs. Big B, uh, you got any favorite Packers Bears memory? Um, I'm going to go with one that I wasn't even born yet when this game happened, but when Brett Favre went out there with like a broken freaking ankle and threw for six touchdown passes against the Bears, like the Bears had to be that bad to let a man with a broken ankle throw six touchdowns on your defense. Like, like that's just phenomenal. Dude, watching Favre like back in the day against the Bears, well, really against anybody, but like against the Bears was so awesome because like when I was a kid, like I had friends that were Bears fans. And like when the Packers were first starting to get good, and it was just a beautiful thing to like just be able to like finally. Finally, the you know, because the Bears owned the Packers like when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, and uh, to finally see like the Packers like do well and just beat up on the Bears was such a beautiful thing. Yeah. I mean, the Bears really, for the from until the Packers got uh, Favre in 92, from that period where after the Lombardi and Hallis uh, battles all the way up until uh, Favre, the Bears. Yeah, it was like 70s, 80s. The Packers were just great track. Yeah. <laughs> and even after dominating the Bears for two decades, the Packers really didn't uh, get the edge in the all-time series until just a few years ago. Yeah, it took a long time to catch up. Like I think it was like late '80s when uh, the Magic Man or the mm-hmm. Packers were just starting to, but they still weren't like doing a lot. But like '89, it, they had a decent. I don't know what like if they beat the Bears. Were. I, I actually that was like the that Bears like where the Bears still suck came from. Oh. And, that that uh the replay game, this replay yeah. game when uh Don Mikowski, uh like th- threw it, but I think he was past line of scrimmage. I've watched this video a hundred uh, times. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Probably yeah. Video. I didn't. I don't remember it like live. Like I was like ten then. Uh-huh. I was born in like yeah. So I, I I was about ten years old. But that like historically is like one of the one of the greatest clips ever. And like I, I from what I heard, they said that's where the Bears still suck. Kind of thing. Interesting. Came I've always wondered, like, who in Tarnation is the Happy Schnapps combo? Where did they come up with this song about Jimmy? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was a thing that that was everyone said back then. See, like to me, like I always try to explain this, like what Bears still suck means to me, which I think it might mean, like, why it was made is it doesn't matter what the Bears are doing. Like even if Justin Fields does do well, and even when they were doing well and they went to the Super Bowl and lost to the Colts. Even when they're beating the Packers, the Bears still suck. Exactly. Like, to me, that's the point. Is it's not like the Bears still suck because they are. They're always bad at football. It's like it doesn't matter what they do. The Bears still suck. Like that's the videos I used to make. I used to. That's kind of how I started with the Bears still suck thing. Uh-huh. I would just put a camera in for my face and I would say some whatever stupid thing, and then I would just say the Bears still suck. And then I would just dance around wherever I was, making a fool of myself. But that was like my original videos when I first started putting like my face on Instagram. Yeah, I think I remember one you had um, right after the Cody Parkey double doink uh, of of that same exact style format, just <laughs> showing that clip and then just dancing around your basement. That was uh, <laughs> one of my favorites. There's so many that uh, I don't even remember. Like one of my very first, like one of my very first, like watched, like a lot of people watched it. Mm-hmm. Was that that game when when Rogers got hurt? Mm. When Rogers got hurt, that's kind of when my Instagram was kind of first starting to flow, and people were starting to see me besides my family. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and uh, Rogers got hurt right away, and then we we're like, "Oh my, this is the season!" Because you know he was hurt for seasons before yeah. that. So it was just like, "Oh!" So I had talked crap that whole week, like, "Oh, the I think the whole off season it was, it was early on," and. uh I was just like, Packers are going to destroy the Bears. Bears suck. And that and he gets hurt. So, like, my phone, I used to have notifications on for everything back then. Uh-huh. I still do sometimes, like, during game day. So I don't miss people trolling me. But my phone was just, like, going off. It was all Bears fans. Like, oh, what now? And they're all, like, laughing. So I just started drinking. Like, <laughs> I was just sitting on my couch, like, all sad. 
Like <laughs> Rodgers is hurt. It looks bad. Looks really bad. And then he came back. And then now I was drinking for fun. And I'm like, hey, he's coming back. And, you know, just it was like a great comeback like that I've ever seen. They win. And I make this rant where I'm just drinking a beer. I got my phone out watching like the TV and I'm like, you bear fan, bro. I'm just like ranting and raving about stuff. <laughs> and the video like went pretty big. Oh my God. And like, that's when like when people started noticing me and like bears fans were like, now they follow me just to troll me. Some are yeah. cool, but we won't talk about the good ones. <laughs> but yeah, that, that was one of my, one of my videos that kind of popped me up a little bit. And, uh, of like, yeah, but I, I I, I bet you, like, most of my, like, half my videos early on were all, like, Bears Still Suck. The, the Bears Still Suck, I mean, that, I, I love that song. And like you said, it doesn't matter what the Bears doing. If the Packers are 0-16 and the Bears are 16-0 and in some dystopian society, then, like, we'll still be playing the Bears Still Suck. Because yeah, they'll still they, be they just naturally do. Uh, and I want to make my own version of that. <laughs> a cover yeah. uh, or like a, a parody of a modern version that that'd be pretty you know yeah i'm not sure i can sing i don't know if i can <laughs> My hey. sound effects <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean they, they're moving to uh some now uh horse racing park in a few years or, or yeah. arlington arlington heights whatever so it can't be if you drive to soldier field anymore um so yeah, and then, it's such a weird thing that that they're moving because I never yeah. been to Soldier Field. You know, a lot of people say it's trash and it's all beat down, mm-hmm. but it's like so historical. But they say they can't exactly. be up or whatever. And uh, but like, I I, I was saying, I was like, the Bears suck so bad, they're getting evicted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pretty surprised. It's like you, say it's very historic, but and that could never happen to Lambeau Field, mainly because the the city owns the team. But I. I guess it, it was really the stadium had to be super awful to a point that they couldn't play anymore. And I know specifically film watchers that watch all 22 can tell how bad the camera angles are at soldier field. And even on the TV broadcast, every single game, the, the camera angles are just so odd and weird out of the normal. So soldier field, just not not the best playing sites. Yeah, I, I don't get how they couldn't upgrade. Like the Packers upgraded theirs, like you know they had that big referendum and all that. So because if, if they didn't update Lambeau Field, Lambeau Field would have been I don't know about that bad, but it would have been similar. Like it would have out of date. Things would have started falling apart. Yeah, but like like dude, you take care of your stadium. Like I, Chicago has all these people. Like you think I don't know. I, I, I it's different because they're not owned by like the city or whatever. But like it's weird to think that they can't get the city to help. You got rich owners. Like why the I think they couldn't take care of this 15 years ago. Whatever. There's yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's end it off here. Big B, let, we'll let you go first. What is your score prediction this week against the Bears? Oh, man. I'm going to say we're going to drop 31 points, and the Bears will score 24 in a mm. Packers victory. Definitely thinking somewhere around that range. Oddly enough, Big B, you and I have been pretty close with our score predictions. I don't care about it that much. It's not like I'm going to go on Twitter and say, oh, look, we were right because we just threw oh, around yes. some random numbers. Yes, There's no will. science that goes behind our predictions. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll say uh, I'll give the Packers eight more, 39-20. Packers get the win. Matt, let's hear it. Uh, yeah, so speaking of predictions, though, I think I was dead on with the Niners game. Hmm. But the thing is, when I make predictions, like, there's no thought process. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. if I'm doing someone else's show or I'm doing my own, I start doing predictions. It's not like I have, like, written down, like, oh, yeah. Like, you ever see guys <laughs> like, me? like, they're like, oh, uh, it's going to be three touchdowns. One's going to be this player. And, like, I don't do it. I just think of a number in my head. I, I, I think I, I was like, I'll say 34-17. Packers. Exactly. I, I, they're, they're, the Bears defense is really good. But I could see that the Packers defense actually – in a, a defensive touchdown or at yeah. least put in the offense in great position. And I think the rivalry, everyone's going to be jacked up. Uh, Rogers is just like elite in Chicago. It's like his second or third, fourth home. He's got so many, you know, he's got that one in Dallas, Yeah, <laughs> but he always does. Well, I think everyone's going to be jacked. Randall Cobb. I could see oh, him, man. you know, falling out just, just, just for the heck of it. They're like, Hey, let's get Randall Cobb. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's certainly going to be an exciting one. 
Packers Bears rivalry, 203rd matchup. Um, gonna be a really fun one. I cannot wait for Sunday. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. No problem. I think you know, me and Big B have talked about it's it's really hard. Nothing against you, but it's kind of to foster like when we have you on a guest, when we have you as a guest on our show, we want to foster that same exact kind of like chill, just talking crap uh, environment that you have on your live show. So I, I think we did a, a good job at that today. Yeah, I, I think it was great. And uh, this is like the only show I do sober. So <laughs> <laughs> this is well, the like most cool here thoughts you're getting. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everybody for watching. Uh, make sure you tune in to Matt's uh, live streams and all the content he's putting out. I'm sure he'll have uh, uh, some great live streams uh, this weekend coming up for Bears Week. His live streams are great. Great. If I wasn't watching the Cheesehead TV live stream every week, it would obviously definitely be uh, Matt Ramage's live watch that is, parties. That's some tough competition. <laughs> 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 Why would you go live during a game when Grassi and She Said TV do? But like, I, most, a lot of my people who watch during a game are from Facebook. Mm. YouTube, but, you know, they, 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 those two dominate YouTube. But uh, yeah. they're great. But I, I just do it. It's fun. So even if nobody watches, I don't care. I'm having a exactly. good time. <laughs> well, great talking to you, Matt. We'll talk to you later. Yeah, sounds good, man. Bears still suck. <laughs>